Dr. Nan Boss. If I haven't met you yet, I'm the owner of Best Friends Veterinary Center. In 2009, the Wisconsin State Legislature passed some new regulations requiring us to fully inform you of the risks of any procedure that we're recommending for your pet, as well as the benefits, and that information must be delivered by a doctor. We thought we would make that process more efficient by videotaping the informed consent discussion for all of our common anesthetic procedures. In surgery, the major risk comes from the anesthesia, not the surgery itself. Today's modern anesthetics and monitoring techniques make this risk very small. This is not to say that the risk of anesthesia is zero. It's a fraction of 1%, far lower than most pet owners think it is, but there is risk there. Most unexpected deaths under anesthesia occur because of an undiagnosed heart problem. That's why we strongly recommend an electrocardiogram before anesthesia. What we're looking for is an abnormality in the electrical signal that controls the heartbeat. A heart that is having a mild problem that is not noticeable during normal activities can fail when stressed by heavy exercise or anesthesia. It's an irregular heartbeat or an inability for the signal to travel through the heart normally that can cause an 18-year-old basketball player to drop dead on the court. That's why the NCAA and um, a lot of high school sports associations are requiring ECG screening for their athletes. And the same thing is true for pets. Before the stress of anesthesia, we should be testing their heart to make sure it's working okay. Um, this is the ECG strip, what it looks like. It's just like what you would see on a heart monitor at a hospital. Um, and this little rhythm strip will help us to know whether that pet is going to do all right under anesthesia. It's not a perfect test. We can't diagnose every heart problem from the ECG strip, but we can catch a lot of them. We probably postpone or um, cancel about half a dozen surgeries a year because of an abnormality we find on the ECG. Electrical conduction malfunctions can be genetic and inherited, as with young pets or athletes, or they can develop later in life. The most severe forms are most common among young, apparently healthy animals. I actually worry less about elderly pets undergoing anesthesia than I do about young ones. Age itself is never an impediment to anesthesia. The important thing is whether the major, major organs, the kidneys, liver, and heart are functioning properly. That's why we do pre-anesthetic blood work and heart screening. We cancel or postpone half a dozen procedures every year because of an abnormality on the ECG screen. Abnormalities that appear on blood tests can also cause us to postpone a procedure, but most commonly they lead to adjustments in the fluid or the anesthetic drugs that we choose. We monitor blood pressure and temperature closely while pets are under anesthesia because low blood pressure and temperature are the most common side effects of anesthesia. Some pets do better on one anesthetic drug than another or wake up more quickly or slowly than others. Each time we administer anesthesia, we keep careful notes so that we can adjust or change our protocol the next time we anesthetize a pet. Occasionally, a pet will have an allergic reaction to something we administer, and we will need medications to counteract that. Other things that concern us for spays and neuters are bleeding during or after surgery and infection. If your dog's breed is prone to hemophilia, it's important to make sure that his or her blood is clotting properly before surgery. The greatest risk for bleeding afterwards is within the first 24 hours of the procedure. The heavier or more overweight a pet is, the higher the risk for bleeding. Using the laser for the surgery incision reduces the risk of bleeding. For a spay where the incision is larger and we're cutting into the abdominal cavity, we'll keep your dog overnight so that she's not moving around very much and that minimizes the risk for bleeding afterwards. There is no one here at night, but by the time we leave, your pet will be recovered from the anesthesia. We just want her to not move around much until the next day. Occasionally, the, a suture breaks or the incision pulls apart or breaks open. Usually in those cases, we can just wrap a bandage around your pet or uh, place a couple skin staples without anesthesia. Occasionally, though, if the incision is too wide open, we may have to anesthetize your pet to tie off a bleeder or to re-suture. It's really important to give the pain medication to your dog or cat after surgery um, because the pain medication is what's going to keep that incision comfortable so that they don't look at it and we don't need to do follow-up surgery to repair damage. Infection risk is also lower if your pet is, is not in pain. And of course, with modern pain medications, there's no reason for your pet to be painful after surgery. While your pet is under anesthesia, we have a golden opportunity to diagnose or even fix other health problems. Hip dysplasia, retained baby teeth, a soft palate that's too long into the back of the mouth on a short-faced dog like a bulldog or a pug are examples. Remember that the spay or neuter may be the only major procedure your pet ever has, so everything that can be done now may save money and effort later on. Congratulations on spaying or neutering your dog. Not everyone does, even though 
spayed and neutered pets live 40% longer, and that also reduces the pet overpopulation problem. With today's modern anesthesia and pain medication and good nursing care, the risk of complications is very small, um, and your dog's going to live a lot longer because we did this procedure. Thank you also for choosing Best Friends for your pet's veterinary care. Thank you.